toward your realism and then maybe relational hidden variables as well. We've discussed now magical realism. We've discussed anti-realism. But how does quantum mechanics then, with its spooky actions at a distance in these other dimensions of, uh, let's see, things that aren't so obvious or they don't seem natural to the realist, like contextuality, non-locality, and so on. How do they resonate with the realist? How did Einstein, for instance, try to make sense of them with his reasoning with EPR? I was going to give you a beautiful answer until the last part. Can we skip to the beginning of the last part about Einstein? And let me tell yeah, you absolutely. How I do it. Absolutely. Okay. So, because... I really think the right way to present what I'm doing is as part of a research program, which has several sides and is more ambitious than understanding quantum mechanics. That is, what we're interested in is getting the whole thing, um, cosmology, quantum mechanics, relativity, unification. And um, let me have this go at getting the whole thing. Because that's that's I think the right place where, yeah, please. where this kind of realism fits in. So um, we start with time, and in, in here I'm discussing the form of the theory as we developed with Clavier Verde. So in this form, we start by thinking of the world as consisting of events, and there are things in the world which are completely distinguishable or definite, and there are things in the world which are not distinguishable or definite. And that's a, we, we think of that as a realist part, place to part, that is, there may be things in the world. We are, when I speak of an observer, I'm always speaking of an embedded, embodied observer in the universe. So my situation with respect to something else that happens may or not be definite, definitive. And I think that's just like, um, what does it call this? Intuitionistic logic or... Um, right, the law of the excluded middle. The law of the excluded middle is gone. Or think of it, things in terms of hiding algebras, which is the way that Fortuny Lagerfeld thinks of it. So I'm an I'm a I'm an observer somewhere caught in the universe, and I can cause events to happen. Events are situations or processes by which something that was indefinite becomes definite or vice versa. And these things that become definite or indefinite are also not things of the whole universe. They're things nearby that I can manipulate somehow. Now, in this world, there exists to start with just these events and causal relations amongst these events. By a causal relation, I mean that if I make an event happen and take the result and put it into another event and put it into another event and so, so, so on, I'm going to have causal relations between. That is, if I see A from one detector and I see another output from a similar detector, it has to be the result has to be consistent with each other. I'm maybe not saying that, but I want there to be a, a consistency between different results, which is strong enough to call it causal. Maybe could we come back to that. Um, and that's all I have in the world. Well, actually, I'm lying. That, plus I have energy, and I have momentum. And I have laws of conservation for them. So with two events send their output, 
which are energies and momenta, to a third event, I can rely on the summation of the two events to be conserved and how much energy they have. But I don't have position, I don't have momentum, I don't have angular momentum, I don't have a long list of other things you might have. My physics starts with the notion of what's distinguishable or not, events and causal relations amongst the events. Okay, so if I have you with me. You do, you do. Identity of indiscernible, identity of indiscernible. So we've got events we can discern, then we've got causal relations between events. Very good, and that's that's right. Now, um, let me play a little bit more. Let me tell you that as part of, in order to hold definitely, in order to make the conservation laws work, I have to choose their forms in certain ways. And let me form the conservation laws of momentum and energy, first of all, to be additive. So if I have energy and momentum coming from different sources, they go out by adding them. I, wouldn't, I don't have to make that choice. In fact, there are choices of forms of extensions of general relativity where we make different choices. And I'll make the simplest one. And I also choose the relationship between energy and momentum consistent with special relativity. So E squared is equal to P squared plus M squared. Again, there is choices I don't have to make. And we have forms of the theory where we make different choices. So that's my, that's almost my full set of rules. Um, I'm going to, I, let me see which, okay. It's just a question of getting them in the right order. Um, I have to choose how the events occur. So I'm going to have what we call the event generator. And we're going to have a number of events which just happened. And we're going to give us an algorithm to choose which next number of events happen. And let's keep that to be two events. So I have what I want to call the present events as ones that are just happening. And they send their output to a next event. And that keeps going on over and over again. Now, if I think about that, I have what I'll call now events. And now events have children, which are going to be the next now events. And I'm going to let ourselves impose that each event can only have a precise number of children. Let's call it three. Once an event has had more children than the limit, it's no longer has any influence on the formation of the future. So we call those past events. Events that have not yet occurred, we call future events. And we, we do not impose Set necessary laws on the future events. As there can be a range of possible future events, and we have some algorithm that chooses them, but it doesn't necessarily choose them deterministically. So this system together is called an energetic causal set. Yeah. Okay. And, um, and that structure sits here, and now I'm going to derive some things from it. One of them is that I can make space emerge. That is, if I pick the other parameters and numbers suitably, I can show that there are little pieces of space 
the space-time that grow and have the geometry of Minkowski space or something near to Minkowski space. And that's a calculation. We can show you how to do that. Um, once I get space and time emerging, um, well, let me let me go, go. There's a lot of things that happen now. Let me go, go in the right order. Um, well, let, let me have a, everything set up in the simplest way first, so that I always get um, a, a correct. Um, ex What's my best word here? Immersion of space and time of the events that I constructed into this model space and time. And so I can have emergence of space and time in a very pretty way while space, is, space time is growing. So this is a point of view which is, this is why I told you I was a presentism, a presentist. So we, and we take this from actually Heisenberg, who had this Heisenberg, it's not a very well-known part of Heisenberg, but Heisenberg at one point had papers in which, he, in which he was discussing the fact that there's no reason to apply a wave function formalism to the past because you you know what the past is, and therefore, first of all, it's, it has no use anymore. Once you know it, it's it's useless to you, except for making a few more events to keep the thing going. And events in the past, therefore, are definite, and events in the future have no meaning yet. So. We really just need a universe which consists of a bunch of finite present events. And so, so that's the direction our, our cosmological theory is going. Maybe I should stop there. There's a bunch of other stuff, but maybe I should stop there.